So another thing about PL inequality and why do we stress so much about PL inequality is, so if I look at least square problems, so for instance uh, ordinary, so we know that a function g of x which is like norm x square, so this is strongly convex. But the moment we look at the affine transformation of this function, so if I define f of x like this, I mean the b part is not that important, but if I look at a function of this form, so this may or may not be strongly convex. So this is strongly convex only if a is full row rank. So however, f, satis f satisfies PL inequality for every a. So this function as I said like even though the original x norm x square this is strongly convex and a fine transformation of it need not be strongly convex, it is strongly convex only if a is full row rank otherwise uh, it will not be strongly convex but it will always satisfy PL inequality for any a and this this kind of function is very common in least squares problem right like this I mean finding an x such that a x minus the distance between a x and b is minimized. So this is very common right. So again this was actually shown in by Karimi in his the same paper 2016 paper that this function always satisfies PL inequality. So let us look at this. So let us consider two points x and y. Okay, and let the question. So the what Karimi showed was, if you have a function g which is strongly convex to start with, and you look at the affine transformation for any a, this will always satisfy PL inequality. Okay. So, if I have a g of x which is uh, sigma strongly convex, so we need to show that f of x defined as g of a x is satisfies pure inequality. for every for all okay and this is not just in the context of uh, regression problem linear regression problem like this but i mean the the same thing you can translate it to logistic regression as well right where where you have one over 1 plus e to the negative ax minus b kind of thing and original uh, i mean if so so as i said i mean like you it is not a very restrictive class of function that we are looking at. In fact, it, if you can show something for pair inequality, function satisfying pair inequality, a lot more like optimization problems uh, can be mapped to uh, this particular class of functions. So let us define u to be a x and v to be a y. So since g is strongly convex. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any matrix A. Yeah. So this need not be just for this particular choice of strongly convex function. Any G, G can be any strongly convex function. Now, if I consider the affine transformation of uh, that particular function, like particular x as a x minus b or a x, let's say. So this would be this need not be strongly convex for uh, any a. In fact, if a is not full row rank, it won't be strongly convex. But this will still satisfy PL inequality. So that's that's the statement. So since g is sigma is strongly convex uh, because we somehow want to get f of x, uh, so we should write g of v because it holds for any any x and y, so it also holds for any u and v. Okay. So what? So gradient of 
all right so what is g of v which is a of g of ax that becomes f of x by definition is greater or oh sorry f of y is greater than or equal to f of x plus uh, so what is gradient of g of u in terms of gradient of f so u so a inverse or a transpose okay so this becomes so g of ax okay no no so v and for v and u it satisfies right so so for f it does not satisfy a strong convexity this function for f it does not but let's say ax is another point in space right v i mean x is like ax is u and a ay is v so for those points u and v g satisfies uh, i mean there is a i mean g is, g is always strongly convex right for any two points so u and v are any two points defined through x and y so we wouldn't have this directly in terms of so let me write this first yes so this this is what it is so right because a transpose g a x is gradient of f of x so this is v minus u is a y minus a x so you can i can write this as a transpose this particular term and that is what it comes down to a transpose g of so and sorry about being sloppy on this one but so let me rewrite this so this is a transpose okay and this is nothing but gradient of f of x yeah yeah so that a is a transpose i have taken this inside right so trans so this is no no so this is still g here right and this is ay minus ax is what i have written this like this and this is a times y minus x also okay so and by definition i mean this is nothing but gradient of f of x so what we get is f y so if i choose y to be x star or the optimal solution so this turns out to be f star is greater than or equal to f of x plus gradient of f of x transpose x star minus x so there is a result by hoffman in uh, i think it in his book in 1952 so that shows that for this optimal point x star so this particular term is actually greater than or equal to or the term inside this thing is actually greater than or equal to the uh, smallest non zero singular value of so let me first write this of matrix a so where theta a is the smallest non zero singular value of a so essentially why do we uh, see a singular value of a here because this is a x star minus x right so you will get that you will get terms of the form a transpose a and singular values are nothing but uh, eigen values of this a transpose a matrix right or the square of it so so this is what so basically what you get is f star is greater than or equal to f of x plus gradient of f of x transpose x star minus x no so this is only for y equal to x star is 
this result is valid. I mean, if had that been the case, then I mean, this is, this becomes strongly convex setting, right? If that result had been valid for any y, this result is valid for only for x star. Yeah. yeah. No, but then it's not true for any y. It's only true for y is equal to x star. No, th so that is the that is the result from Hoffman 95 that I am talking about. So this so this this type of function, this type of inequality. So usually with for uh, for a strongly convex function, you have this with f y is greater than or equal to f of x. But if you only have it in terms of uh, optimal optimal x star, so this such such type of functions are called. If a function satisfies this, such type of functions are called weakly strongly convex. So if f satisfies if g satisfies pale inequality, then I mean the first thing, the first key thing to show here is that f is weakly strongly convex, and then we show that it also satisfies pale inequality. So this, if f satisfies just this inequality, without any y, right? So then it we call it weakly strongly convex, not strongly convex. Otherwise, with y it would have been strongly convex right away, right? So f star is greater than or equal to this. So f star must also be greater like so. This is the right hand side is true for specifically for x star. So, if I try to minimize this with respect to y, let us say in Rn, this whole right hand side I mean this would still be true because this minimum value, this minimum value is going to be smaller than when you choose y is equal to exactly x star. Right? So, this is always going to be true, ok. So, if I try to minimize this, it the minimum value can be x star or something else, but the value that you are going to be getting of this particular function that is always going to be small less than or equal to the value when you choose y equal to x star, right. So, that is what we have written, ok. Ok, so f star is greater, greater than or equal to this particular term. Now, the un for the unconstrained minimizer of this thing, what should we have? With respect to y gradient of f of x plus sigma theta a over 2 y minus x that should be equal to 0, right. Let us see because we are trying this is an unconstrained minimization on y that means y minus x is minus 2 over sigma theta a gradient of f of x ok. So, let us now rewrite this. So, that means f star is greater than or equal to f of x plus gradient of f of x transpose this term which is going to be let me just write this plus sigma theta a over 2 y minus x square. So, sigma theta a by 2 and then you have 4 sigma square theta x square. So, you get plus you get 1 over 2 sigma theta a. right which is same as f star is greater than or equal to f of x minus 1 over 2 sigma theta a ok which is same as 1 over 2 sigma theta a gradient square. So, this is greater than or equal to f of x minus f star. So, this implies that f satisfies pair inequality. with mu equal to sigma times theta i ok. So, so this is the proof. So, essentially I mean this is again to show that if you have a function which is sigma strongly convex then you consider an affine transformation of that function like of that variable x and you define a new function like this 
this would satisfy i mean this need not be strongly convex but this would always satisfy peer inequality always satisfy peer inequality with uh, exponent sigma times theta i so we are now going to look at uh, robustness of robustness of fx tsdf and i'll explain what what do we mean by robustness so typically when we compute like when at least in the data driven regime when we try to so we need not have the analytical expression for the gradient of f right so we look at the sample like different uh, examples or different sample points and based on the those we try to estimate the gradient of f of x as let's say i equal 1 through n the gradient evaluated at different points right that's how we try to approximate the gradient so the gradient computation need not be exact is what i'm trying to suggest so if you have a dynamical system which looks something like this p minus 2 or p minus 1 q minus 2 or q minus 1 so that gradient of f of x need not be exact right uh, in most cases so let's say we we have some in in exactness in the gradient and this in in exactness we are going to be capturing through some additive uh, disturbance like this okay so purely think of it as a control problem or for the, for now so you have an additive disturbance that is being added to your system the equilibrium so for it to guarantee like for you to guarantee that the equilibrium is still the x star or the optimal solution you have to assume certain structure on this disturbance right so this disturbance should be a vanishing kind of disturbance so what we assume is that norm of this should be less than equal to some l times uh, x minus x star square something like this so that x star is still the equilibrium for this why if even if we do if we do not have this kind of assumption that means even if we are at x star if epsilon f of x is non zero so you would still be uh, like i mean you would still be oscillating around the equilibrium right so we assume this kind of vanishing perturbation or vanishing disturbance And what we are going to show is that if we choose, so if we choose C1 and C2 to be sufficiently large, then we would still be, then we would still converge in a fixed amount of time, even in the presence of disturbance. x amount of time okay so if you have a vanishing disturbance like this you are still guaranteed to converge in a fixed amount of time as long as you choose c1 and c2 to be sufficiently large and this also answers your question uh, regarding like i mean iss kind of thing well i mean you do not really need iss but it's it's largely a i mean it's it's a large gain kind of uh, c1 and c2 if you choose c1 and c2 to be sufficiently large you can actually subsume this disturbance and let's see how okay and for this we are going to be using the result that we just derived uh, which is on the function if f satisfies peer inequality then f has at least quadratic growth so we are going to be assuming that f in this case satisfies peer inequality peer inequality with some exponent mu greater than 0. So, if f satisfies field inequality, what do we know about that function would have at least quadratic growth, right? Okay. So, this is from that function as at least quadratic growth f satisfies peer inequality so definition of peer inequality is this in greatness of this okay is this clear and with this assumption so x minus x star that is greater than equal to epsilon x over l 
So this is greater than equal to mu over two L. Okay. So what does this give us? So from here we know that this thing is less than or equal to L over mu square. All right. So let's call this one. Okay. Any questions on this? So we have an upper like upper bound on the this vanishing disturbance in terms of the gradient of f of x. And this would come handy later. So we know that f satisfies scale inequality. So if we want to show convergence to the optimal solution, what could should be a good Lyapunov candidate? f of x minus f star right. Here we are not going to be using half uh, gradient norm square because we do not have anything information about the hessian of f. We have it for the strongly convex case and if we are using Newton type of flow then we can also work with strictly convex case. But then since for function that satisfy, satisfy just a pure inequality and need not I mean are not necessarily strongly convex this part I mean this is a good choice of the Lyapunov candidate right f of x minus f star. So, v dot then turns out to be okay and x dot is the this particular dynamical system over here. So, let us write this. So, gradient f transpose minus c1 plus epsilon x let's uh, just okay so this thing is equal to minus c1 times p over just as before this particular term minus c2 times this particular term and then the last term is gradient of f transpose uh, epsilon okay. So how do we eliminate epsilon from here using this thing right but we only have a constraint on the norm of epsilon. So for that you can use Cauchy choice here right because this thing is going to be less than or equal to norm of this times norm of this using Cauchy Schwarz right is this clear. So that means v dot is less than or equal to minus c1 minus c2 plus and if I use this particular condition over here let us let us call this L bar or something this is going to be less than or equal to L bar times Q okay. So let me rewrite this I mean without let us not do this particular thing right now. So let us P over P minus 1 Q over Q minus 1 and L bar this thing. Okay. So here I mean you are getting I mean you almost without this particular term this would the derivation would have exact would have been exactly the same right. Now you have some positive term which is trying to make sort of uh, I mean and with the with an opposite polarity right. So we somehow want to subsume this. So for p greater than 2 so what is this exponent p over p minus 1. So, for p greater than 2, p over 2p minus 1 is a number between 0 and 1, right. So, the square of this is going to be a number between 0 and 2. So, if essentially, okay. And for q, 
being a number between 1 and 2, so we know that q over q minus 2q minus 1 is a number between, uh, is a number greater than 1. So, q over q minus 1 is, an, is basically going to be greater than 2, okay. Now, we have two regimes, one is an exponent less than 2 and the other one is greater than 2. Now, this positive term over here, so when norm of gradient of f that is less than 1, okay, when norm of gradient of f is less than 1, so what kind of inequality would we have between something like this versus which is bigger? When the norm of the gradient of f, so this thing is greater than or equal to this, when norm of gradient of f is greater than or equal to 1, right? And when norm of gradient of f is less than or equal to 1, no, no, sorry, sorry, the other one is my bad. is less than or equal to 1, this is the inequality you have and when norm of gradient of f is greater than or equal to 1, you have the other inequality which is, okay. So that means depending on which regime you are in, either you can use this to subsume this particular additive term or you can use this to subsume this additive term. So effectively, if I choose C1 and C2 which are whose values are more than L bar. I can write this as v, v dot is C1 minus L bar P over P minus 1 and minus C2 minus L bar ok. Because it like really depends on which regime you are in. So, at least one of the terms is going to subsume and then you can also decrease the other exponent by this. So, as long as you choose C1 and C2 to be sufficiently large, in this case the definition of sufficiently large is, they should be more than L bar. So, this holds true, right? And therefore, now the rest of the proof follows similarly. So, I can write this as V dot is less than or equal to minus C1 L bar. Now, this is gradient of norm square. 1 over 2p minus 1 minus c2 minus l bar q over 2 q, q minus 1. Now, this is nothing but 2 times v, it is well not exactly 2 times v, but we can further use pure inequality here, right. So, this is nothing but less than or equal to minus c1 minus l bar. What is this term? It is less than or equal to 2 mu v right. Is everyone following this? No, so for like yeah, if you choose p to be I mean p is always chosen to be a num number greater than 2 and q is a number between 1 and 2 right. And for these choices we know that this holds true and this holds true. No, that is p upon 2 p minus 1 between 0 and 1, right. So, p upon p minus 1 is z between, between 1 and 2, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, it is also, this is also true, but you can always write this as 1 and 2, that is fine. I mean, it is always, yeah, I mean, you are dividing it by a smaller number, so it is always going to be a number between more than 1, that is fine. But the point is that you are going to get an exponent which is less than 2 and an exponent which is greater than 2. So, you can using those exponents you can always subsume this, right. So, if you want to subsume this particular thing, so you won't be able to subsume it like this, right. So, you have to choose a value of q such that you actually get an exponent greater than 3, right. So, so it won't work for any q between 1 and 2, but let us say if I choose a number q like 3 by 2. It is also a number between 1 and 2, but if I choose q to be 3 by 2, then q over q minus 1 is uh, 1.5 by 0.5, which is 3, right. So, for q greater than 3 by 2, you would have this to be true, right, and it would subsume this particular thing, okay. So, c1, c2 to be greater than l bar and q to be greater than 3 by 2. 
Yeah, I mean, if you let's say if if you do not know the information about L bar or L, you just choose them to be sufficiently large. It's not it's not upper bounded, right? It's lower bounded. So you can choose them to be large enough. So eventually you would subsume that L bar. Okay. But Q, you need it to be greater than three by two. And this p over two p minus one minus c two minus l bar two mu v. This is q over two q minus one, right? So now you have it in the form where you can just simply use the Polyakov's condition for fixed time stability, and you can show that x would converge converge to x star in a fixed time. Okay? Is this clear? Yeah, yeah. So. So the conditions are, let me rewrite it. So this works. So we as we need C1, C2 to be greater than L bar. Again, if even if you do not know L bar, you can choose C1 and C2 to be large enough, right? So that eventually it's going to be greater than L bar. And Q to be greater than 3 by 2. Obviously Q is a number between 1 and 2, but it you want it to be greater than 3 by 2. So that why do we need q to be greater than 3 by 2? So that you can ensure that this particular this particular exponent q or q minus 1 that is greater than 3. Less than, let's see. Yeah, q should be less than 3 by 2. If you if I use q to be let's say 2, yeah, q should be less than 3 by 2. Right. Yeah, so if q is less than 3 by 2, then the exponent q over q minus 1, so that is q over q minus 1, that is greater than 3, okay. So you need q to be less than 3 over 2. So this implies that q over q minus 1 is greater than 3 and that way you can, for regime when gradient of f is more than 1, you can actually use this particular term to subsume. Uh, this great this positive term right when gradient of uh, f is less than uh, when the gradient of f is normal gradient of f is less than 1 then anyway you can use this term to subsume this mm -hmm. Because there is a minus here, right? Okay. Again, today's lecture was a bit math heavy, again, because we were looking at, looking at concepts that are relatively more advanced. But I just wanted to cover those uh, for people who are generally interested in this area. Uh, from next lecture onwards, we will be looking at, uh, we will be revisiting the discrete optim discretized optimization algorithm. And maybe we'll start looking towards something called uh, augmented Lagrangian method or the method of multipliers, and then that would eventually connect us with uh, how do we like when you want to solve constraints of the form ax equal to b, but only different agents know different parts of that matrix A. Then how do they sort of collaborate together to solve a common uh, like to work under a common constraint and minimize a common objective function, and then eventually we would uh, from like from that lecture onwards, we would then eventually start diverging more towards distributed optimization. That is the key uh, part of this course. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at least from this if you choose c1 and c2 to be sufficiently large and then q to be a sub, I mean an exponent which is less than 3 by 2, this would work in continuous time. Now when let us coming to discretized implementation, the discretized implementation would have the exact same uh, kind of considerations like for instance if I look at discretized implementation like this. As I said like the only kind of guarantees that you have is I mean if the continuous time dynamical system has certain property. The discretized implementation would have that property only for a sufficiently small eta. 
So eta cannot be too large and that also makes sense because you are actually scaling the gradients up right when you are closer to the optimal solution or even you are when you are farther off you are scaling the gradients up. So if you choose very larger if you are going to be choosing very larger step sizes then then you are probably making the uh, discretized implementation divergent. So, no eta ball is going to be like in general eta I mean eta is like there is an upper bound on eta. But what that upper bound is, I mean, we don't know. I mean, that's an open problem.